we will give you a chance at the end to turn on your mics, to talk to us, give us a bit of feedback and questions. So I'd just like to welcome you all here tonight for the final session of the Limber Coaching and Games um, webinars. The last three weeks we have touched on planning your coaching session with Noel Hartigan. Uh, we looked at the importance of appointing a suitable club school and coach and develop good links between your club and local schools. And uh, David O'Dea looked at that for us. Um, last Wednesday night, Paul Brown and James Ryan looked at the tackle in Hurling, which is going to lead us on to tonight, coaching the tackle in Gaelic football. And that's going to be by myself, Gary McCarthy, Gaelic Development um, Administrator from Southside Limerick City. And with me tonight is Peter Nash, who is the Hurling Development Officer in Limerick City, and he's a current senior footballer with Limerick. So tonight, I'll just move it on there. So tonight, we will focus on coaching the tackle in Gaelic football. It's a massively important part of the game now, and as most defensive teams' models or system now is actually the basis and fuel of starting your attack. So when coaching the tackle tonight, we are going to try and keep it as simple and as simplistic approach as we can. So for us, the main focus will be trying to highlight the different tackles in the game, the key teaching points, the rules, and also games that are going to help us understand the tackle more clearly and coach to our players so that we can develop a perfect basis so that they can perform the tackle. So most of us on the webinar tonight would probably believe that they know the tackle, they know the rules of the tackle, if they saw it, they'd know it, but the coaching of the tackle and getting the right message across may be an issue for some of our coaches. So we're just going to try and see, can we highlight those issues that you might face? And then can we actually put it out to our players and participants when we get back out onto the field? So just moving on again, um, we have our contents page. So uh, it's just going to give us a breakdown of what we'll actually feature in our tackling session tonight. So we have already went through the introduction and the formalities that goes with that. Um, I will then go on and define the tackle and talk about when we use it, where we use it and why we use it. Um, Peter will then explain the rules surrounding the tackle, um, which we got a good bit of input. Um, which we got a good bit of input um, from the referees um, in Limerick and we got a great insight off of him. Uh, Peter will then look at the stages of de development in the tackle, so looking at our body position and progression from underage to adult. Um, after we will target the specific skills we use in the game and tackling, and we have categorised these into four main headings. So you can see them there on your screen, are four of these of the tackle, or play or deny and dispossess. We will then go on to the game-based tackling activities, um, relevant sort of sports, session planning surrounding the tackle, and finally, our conclusion. So, so, Peter, you might come in here, right? So these are basically just our buzzwords or, or words that we can relate to the tackle and defending. And we just we actually just put this together two days ago and we said it would be a nice little insight. So, Peter, do you want to come in there and just have a chat about this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, this was just an idea we put together there to um, to just see what would potentially come out of it as such. You know, um, there are so many different alleyways we could have gone down with this topic. I know Paul Brown acknowledged it last week. You could do you could do a seminar a seminar on this. Not to mind a webinar. Um, we could go down into defensive systems. We could elaborate in a number of different ways, but. Ultimately, everything that underpins all systems, all setups, all structures, everything within the defensive side of the game comes from an individual or a group's ability to be able to perform the tackle efficiently and effectively in order to gain the outcome required from the defensive setup and structure. Everything we do as regards setting up in defensive aspect of the game is to create opportunities where we can make contact, dispossess and develop the play from 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 that point of view. So I just want to acknowledge the fact that we could have gone down any alleyway with this, but also I want to acknowledge the fact that there's, look, there's a lot and a lot of um, of knowledge in the room and experience in the room here and on this webinar. And we just hope that there be, would be one, maybe two things that you can possibly take from this, but that absolutely everybody can take one or two things from it. So when we were looking at this, we wanted to frame it 
and we wanted to frame defending for every individual taking part in this webinar in order to then go on and define the tackle and how we would approach the tackle. So we looked at that from three key points of view. Point of view of yourself, framing it yourself. How, how would you describe it? What words would you associate with it? How do you feel about it? Then the referee's view and then a player's kind of input through the use of a few quotes and get their feelings on it again and get that three pronged approach of the people who would be involved on the pitch and the people who would be involved on the sideline. So for me, defending is an art. Like I, I absolutely love the tactical element of it. I, I, I love the setup. I love creating understanding around it. I love the impact it can have in a game and and how we can change the shape and the flow. How we can manipulate momentum by um, putting numbers behind the ball or trying to play a more expensive game. But ultimately, defending being a construct within the game that is required by all fifteen players from from number one to fifteen. Um, so. There are a couple of different quotes that maybe over time would have stood out to me in relation to defending. One of these would come from Paolo Maldini and he would say that if I've had to make a tackle, I've already made a mistake. Um, and that resonated with me massively. It just kind of. It just kind of. Explain to me or it just kind of put the point across that that OK, this guy is, is t thinking on a different level. He, he's trying to put pictures in opposition players head of things that are on in areas that he wants them to play into and things that aren't on in areas that he doesn't want them to play into. Um, and also something that came out of last week's webinar was how eloquently Keane Lynch put the selflessness of effort in his quote. And that really stood out to me in the fact that that's exactly what defending is. I think it is the most honest side of the game. I think it's an art. If I was to pick three words out of this, which I would be asking everybody here to do would be like it, it's just the art of of timing and precision. It's the art of its elegance, its experience, its physicality. I could pick any three words out of this, but I think we all look at defending and look at the tackle from a different viewpoint. So what I'd like you to do, or what I'd like you to give you the opportunity to do, and this is completely optional, I'd just like you to scan across this page and scan across this slide for a minute and if you could potentially pick out three words that you could construct a sentence that would define defending for you let's say even the first three words that really stand out there in that jumble for you and maybe even it doesn't have to be everybody again it's optional you could pop it into the chat box and we could potentially discuss it as things go on we won't discuss it now because we'll get we'll get hammered on with the um presentation but it may be something that we, might be nice to revisit at the end to see that what match did what you pulled out of this first slide match up with maybe what you hopefully got out of um, the presentation. Um, so I'll just give you a minute just to scan across that, and if you'd like, please do participate and and uh, pop something into the chat box. <laughs> Hi Donald. Um, yeah, the, the only thing I can say is that um, I know this occurred a couple of occasions last week and the only advice that they had um, was to log out and log back in again and, and hopefully that that, that that would do the job. Perfect, I see a couple here coming in. Thank you very much. Thanks. And also it's 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 an option that if there's a word there that really, really stands out, really, really stands out that's not on, on this jumble, please put it forward as well. We'd we'd love to see that. I see control coming in there, great word.
some good stuff coming in there now in fairness absolutely brilliant yeah i just want to leave it sit there for a minute keep thinking like it yeah just want to leave it sit there for a minute and uh, give people a chance to to scan it and attitude awareness positioning contact control deny the very very point that we're looking to make is that absolutely everybody is pulling out a different concoction of three words like attitude may pop up in four of the examples but it's accompanied by two completely different words so that's the viewpoint from from us as coaches like we we have such a broad spectrum of opinions and approaches based around defending and the tackle and the right way to go about things um so like i said we're just hoping that from tonight you'll take one or two things from this that will align with your principles but also may broaden horizons to a certain extent as well uh, i love uh, i love uh, attitude 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 yeah 100 uh, def percent defending for me if i was to define it would it's that selflessness of effort that keen spoke about but it's an attitude it's it's a want within an individual it's a desire to disrupt it's an it's a desire for the good of the team and for the good of the situation that we're in to want to make a group competitive because ultimately in order to be competitive you need to be able to defend well be organized be structured and allow you to, to afford you the opportunity to go and express yourself and play the game at the level you want to play it at so if absolutely if anybody wants to keep coming in with those but i'm just going to kick on with the next slide so we want to give the next viewpoint then um the man in the middle the man the man on the whistle in control of the situation so we've got some great input here from some referees in limerick some a couple of quotes here underneath the actual rule itself stood out to me in particular because it was a constant theme that came up in in discussions that that this was one thing that referees focused in on so I've practiced reading this out, but I've been practicing football all my life and that doesn't always go to plan as well. So I'm, I'm going to just read out the rule and this quote and just give a few kind of ideas around it or just kind of pick out a few words that kind of stand out to me. So the tackle is a skill where one or more players may dispossess an opponent or frustrate his objective within the rules of play. A tackle is aimed at the ball, not the player. A tackler may use his body to confront the opponent, but deliberate bodily contact such as punching, slapping, arm holding, pushing, tripping, jersey pulling, or a full frontal charge is forbidden. The only deliberate contact allowed is that in the course of a fair charge, one player only, with at least one foot on the ground, makes a shoulder to shoulder charge on the player in possession. So that's a far more defined rule than what was put out for the hurling based on what I saw. It, it it literally it, it limits a lot of actions with the upper body so it limits it it highlights basically the arms and their approach as a lot of what is at fault for will be potentially giving away fouls and the referees backed up this rule without even me putting this little bit across to them and the couple of quotes they came across were like the hands are key in preventing a foul the majority of fouls conceded in the tackle are in relation to either hand placement, shape of hand, whether that's closed fist or an open hand, use of hand in relation to a slapping action that's not on the ball, or pulling of a jersey, or the dragging of a hand on a shoulder, or the use of a lazy hand in relation to attempting a tackle and not making an honest effort to withdraw this hand in a prompt fashion. So asking to elaborate, asking the individual to elaborate on this, they really focused in on slapping action. Once the ball is in possession, once the ball is in arm or underneath arm, it's not in play. So that slapping action is a wasted energy to a certain extent and a high probability of giving away a foul. Whether it's open hand or closed fist, what I really, really got back from the referee in question here with this quote was the fact that the ball to a certain extent has to be presented in order for it to be competed for. So Moving on to the next uh, quote, and this came from a source of frustration from a referee. Um, it's a perception out there among players and coaches that the use of the near hand is a free pass in relation to the tackle and not conceding a free. It is something I hear regularly when a free is conceded that a player will respond by acknowledging the use of their inside hand when in fact it was used to play the hand of their opponent or there was a dragging action on the body or jersey of their opponent. Now, us as coaches can only coach on our interpretation of this rule. 
players can only play on their interpretation of the rules and referees again can only referee on their interpretation of the rules and as human beings they're fans of the GA they can only they have their gripes they have the things in the game that they would love to see changed they're human beings at the end of it all so the one thing I would take from my discussions with referees along this would be if we could open lines of communication between referees, and I know it's something that's being done in Limerick or has been offered up in Limerick as an opportunity for referees to come out and talk to clubs and talk to groups of players about the common things that come up in games that are sources of frustrations for players. It may broaden our understanding to a certain extent, but it also may build that relationship through creating those lines of communication. And it may be an option for anybody who's tuning in from other counties I know that I've heard some deadly positive stories about referees coming out, talking to groups, talking to clubs, and it ultimately shifting the focus away from the frustration that may limit their impact on a game for five to ten minutes based on something that went against them to change in the face of how, how they approach the game in total. So I hope this is friendly to a certain extent. I'm going to hand you over to Gary for the player's view, and I'll be back to talk about the stage of the development in a few minutes. Yeah, lovely. So we've already asked your input on what you think the tackle is and how you would define it. Um, and we just looked there on how, you know, how our referees see it. So this one's actually a nice one. So last week we got input from our senior hurling team at the moment, the Limerick Senior Hurlers. So we wanted to do the same on what the Limerick Senior Footballers, how they envisage their tackling. Do you know... What, what, what is the story inside their camp and how they feel or what they see is actually the tackle. So instead of me actually reading it all out, I'm going to leave it up on the screen. So I'm going to leave it up for a minute or two minutes and I'll move it on to the next one because we have another two quotes from another two players. So just read while I'm talking or I might even just give you a chance to read and I'll pop in there again. So the first one you can see there is from Ian Corbett. And uh, the second one is from Robbie Childs. And the next two on the other page are from Michael Donovan and Killian Fahey. So just give them a small little read and we'll come back to it then. Okay, I'll leave it up for another second. Okay, and we can show it in the end anyway if someone wants to see them again. We'll just move on. So these are from Killian Fahey, Drum Broadford, and Michael Donovan Galbally. So just see, can you pick out some words that we had in our first? word board or whatever you'd like to call it. Excellent. So I'll just go back there. So again, so let's look at the top one. The tackle. The tackle is a skill which a player may dispossess an opponent or frustrate his objective within the rules of play. The tackle is aimed at the ball and not the player. So, just that little quote that I picked out from somewhere, it's probably very, you know, a written in the book definition and, you know, we have plenty of ways to interpret it, but the way I look at it is dispossessing an opponent or frustrating his object within the rules of play. And I always look at other sports and how we can, you know, maybe link them and how, how, how they actually incorporate into each other. And I just think about the frustrate his objective within the rules of play. I always think about the Barcelona effect and how they used to, you know, how they used to tackle when they didn't have the ball. They had this rule for five seconds and they used to go manic for five seconds. They used to try and win back the ball. So it's what they were doing off the ball and their movement without actually trying to make big hits or you know wasting energy and wasting negative energy they were just putting applying pressure on the next pass so 
when we think about tackle, we usually solely think about winning and capturing the ball and blowing a player out over the sideline, big hits and all of this. But there's a lot more to the art of tackling. It kind of compromises of marking a player, shadowing a player, checking an opponent's run, stopping the player in possession's momentum, applying contact, pressure, mistake before winning the ball back. Now, now after all you've done and you've applied all that pressure and stopping the momentum and closing down the space, as then we can focus on the skill of dispossessing the ball. So obviously the tackle, when we do, we obviously tackle when we don't have the ball. So from set pieces um, where the opposition don't have the ball, we could have lost possession and now we are trying to win it back. So i.e. turnovers. And also we tackle not just to win primary possession of the ball, but often to stop up our opportunities are creating of scoring opportunities so that basically um so that basically we tackle to stop teams from scoring so where do we tackle the simple answer to that is everywhere so the game has evolved so much now that we all have this 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 cliche of everyone from 1 to 15 needs to be able to defend and tackle but this is actually very evident and true now um <clears throat> uh, take two of the best teams in in both codes at the moment. So you look at Dublin and Limerick. So in every area of the pitch, um, when they don't have possession, like the veracity of the Limerick forwards to tackle in the opposition's half of the pitch is immense by the forwards. And Dublin, Dublin are just unbelievable when they lose the ball and are instantly able to get defence inside the ball again. And they make it so hard for teams to get to their, their um, I suppose, their area of the pitch where there's a goal threat or where there's a scoring threat. So that's what we think about or what we talk about when we try to define the tackle. So I'm going to bring you on again to Peter, who's kind of going to go through the stages of development of the tackle from, say, underage and where your body needs to be all the way up to the adult age. So, Peter, you can take away that. So, Thanks, Gary. Yeah. Um, so just moving on to the stages of the development there, we looked at it from, of course, the point of view of the child, the youth and the adult. And what are the priorities at each stage of development and the things we should be focusing on where best or where possible? So, again, at the at the child level, we're, we're trying to prepare them for the game that they're going to play. And ultimately, this out and out tackle where we're trying to coach hand in, hand out, and, and it's just not required for their game. Um, what they require is an opportunity for them to build a foundation of which is a movement base. So we can build a movement base in order to build a skill set on top of that in any specific sport that we choose to specify in at a certain point, once we don't specify too early, that will allow us to flourish within game scenarios. And ultimately what underpins all that is being able to move. I, I see a lot of the time within coaching, we come under pressure, particularly with young kids that, OK, we played a game, we played a game, we played a game. And it's 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 so important that we that we played a game. But then we realise then that we look at the game, we analyse it and we see that there are skills breaking down and we react to that by working on those skills. Then the skills improve, we put them back into the game and we find then that it's it's certain areas and aspects of movement that break down. and when really we need to flip the pyramid on its head and lay the base for a certain extent with a movement, building that capacity in which they can flow and understand and be aware of their body and their body position and how they move without ultimately being aware of it or it being told to them we're trying to create situations and scenarios where they fall into these pictures or fall into these kind of pictures that are described here beside the couple of points where we look at the couple of children playing tag in the schoolyard. We have a player in an athletic position, feet shoulder with apart, knees over toes, shoulders over knees, in a white t-shirt, facing up to another player with a hip hitch, trying to drive off the inside edge of their left foot in order to create a space between them. And that's in a game of tag, but you can see it occurring an incredible amount of times within every game and any one-on-one -on -one situation exactly what's described within that picture is exactly what you'll see at any level between any group of players um so again for for that child level there are two ways two core ways to work on tackling with children and that's ultimately playing tag building that foundation that movement base where we focus on agility balance and coordination and everything that is required for every skill that we will need moving forward 
and playing the game itself. Now, the game itself, a child level between 6, 8, 10 and 12, 12 maybe not so much, but it doesn't overly require the use of the tackle. You'll see the beehive effect where the ball breaks and you have five or six kids in around it battling for the ball. It may not seem like that's an important aspect, but that is an incredibly important aspect in their stage of development. So as they become more athletic, as they move on, players will react quicker, pick up that break, and the game will open up and expand. But that time in that stage of development for that child is going to be their chance to get used to close contact, to get used to being able to absorb a certain impact. Now, it's an impact dealt from a person of their own size, age and ability as much as possible, where possible, between six and eight and ten. But it's it's that little buffer. It's that little kind of, OK, I'm used to taking that little contact because I've, I've, I felt it at under eight level. And then it's a gradual building as we develop physically of the levels of physicality that are required to play the game. So that beehive effect, again, is yes, it's something that at times we try to break up with our coaching and we talk about zones in order to create awareness and understanding around them. But preparing them physically to a certain extent to be able to absorb impact is a huge, huge thing. And that beehive effect is key to that. Now, there are a couple of, day, couple of different ways that we can manipulate certain games in order to approach that aspect of the game, building that understanding of physicality and that awareness of bodies around me, the use of tackle bags, being able to fall and get back up, and um, being able to roll, tumble, tuck, all of these things, building that resilience in a young child so that they're not shocked at a certain stage when they move up and the physicality changes. So again, just to run through the points, it's building key fundamental movement skills, focusing on agility, balance and coordination. And every tackle you, you look to make, you will need to be agile, you will require balance and strength, and you will require coordination for the use of your hands and that hand-eye, hand-foot coordination. Body position or athletic stance. I talk about athletic stance and I'll give it a little example later on of how I would approach that um, explaining athletic stance and how we would approach that with a young child, building awareness around extremities. So again, I will lay a little example out just here now. If we fill a hand, let's say, with a football, we play a simple game of tag in a 10 by 10 square with six players in it. Every single player in that area has a football in their hand, but they must keep their hand in this shape. So they must keep their hand where the palm is facing the sky and the football sits in that hand. Now, I would always describe the hand as their dinner plate and the football as their dinner. This means that they have a hand occupied and they have a free hand. And the object of the game is the way you tag your partner or the way you tag someone is you must knock their dinner off their plate. And the only way you can knock their dinner off their plate is by turning your thumb to the ground and touching the ball off their dinner plate when they're not looking. So that creates a little option, a little kind of understanding of they're aware of their extremities. They're using a combination of movements between they must get into the athletic position, feet shoulder with apart, knees over toes, shoulders over knees, head up and chest up and hands centered. But they're also moving their feet and using their hand at the same time. And that seems fairly simple kind of idea, but it doesn't occur as naturally to some young kids as it does to, let's say, us as adults. And we must always be conscious of that. Our use of language is the key to framing and progressing good habits. So we must form them and then progress them. And if they can identify with language that they've heard at an early level all the way through the pathway, it makes the reception of points and coaching points later on much easier. So again, if they constantly hear feet shoulder width apart, on the balls of your feet, knees over toes, shoulders over knees, head up, hands neutral, they'll know exactly what we're talking about. We don't want to complicate that message for young kids, and I'll explain later on exactly how we do that, but this is just to frame the original stage of development for a child. And we move on, it changes for youth. It's a process of building understanding in order to learn to compete. Now, this is their learning the game phase. So between the ages of, for the youth is described as 12 to 18, this is where they learn constructs of the game. 
this is where we can effectively approach them from a cognitive point of view in order to broaden their horizons gradually through that process. Now, there are a couple of things we must do and there are a couple of things we must ensure happen at this stage of development, and that's an understanding of the technique. So we must provide information and we must provide opportunities for repetition. So exactly like Paul and James were saying last week, if we put them in a situation that they're not conditioned to deal with, they will not react or respond well to it. So we must approach the tackle and we must approach the coaching of it. Again, like I said, I'll give examples later on, but framing it needs to be about and understanding that at different stages, you are going to develop physically differently, but the skills of the game will always, always be the skills of the game. So we're looking at building specific technique, looking at building that defensive IQ, building game and in-game situational understanding. And once we talk about understanding physicality and sometimes the need for it, but oftentimes the need to avoid it or the need for the technique to underpin what we're doing. That's what we need to shift the focus towards. So we talk about use of game scenarios, building on principles of the game. We give examples of that later on. And like I said, a certain amount of emphasis must be placed on physical development. But immaculate technique is the leveler at all levels. And that's the one thing I've learned. If we can focus in on giving a, chair, a young player an, op an opportunity to take in info, repeat it, understand it, then put them in a scenario or a modified game that's designed to focus in on that area, they have a better chance of success when they go towards there's a full game and no safety net. But ultimately, it's the long term success we need to look at. And it's even when there's a full game and no safety net, it's not thinking about the 15 year old in front of us in the match we want to win. It's thinking about that 15 year old at 25 and what they will have learned. So it's an opportunity that's open to discuss exactly what happened, to learn from it, and the development is the key. So moving on to adult level. So adult level then is honing skills learned and building on experience. So on a personal level as a player, I don't feel that I began my, my real true development until I stepped into adult level. Because again, I came out of, I came out of minor or I came out of youth, the games that I was playing at the time. And I just had my eyes opened everywhere. Everywhere I went, I had my eyes opened. I had my eyes opened to club training, the level of physicality that I wasn't used to because I was 18 and the person I was playing was 10 years older than me. They had a wealth of experience and also they had physically developed. I didn't have it in my I didn't have it in my toolbox to compete in that way, so I had to find another way to compete. Then I had the opportunity to move in with Limerick and I just got opened to a completely different level of coaching again, the co where the coaching and the tackle was actually broken down, exactly what was expected of you and... I got opportunities then to to really understand it and grow and think about it and reflect. And then we talk about game scenarios. We talk about situations. Every single night I went to train and I had to mark Johnny McCarthy. And that was an eye opener every night. Um, absolutely an eye opener every night. Um, we talk about Paula Maldini earlier on talking about if I've had to make a tackle, I've had to make a mistake. Um, I would view that as if I give him a chance to make a tackle, I've made a big mistake because he read the game so well and he'd put hands in you, he'd stop you up, he'd delay you, he'd send you into areas of the pitch that you didn't want to go with your early runs and it was just a real, real eye-opener. And again, then, if we move on to talk about delaying and denying dispossess, I remember going up to play Tyrone in a qualifier and I was Martin Cottle and McCarran the same day and I remember starting in the first five minutes um, very raw now, young player going up, um, delight for the opportunity and looking to learn and understand. And then all of a sudden, it starts well. You get on a couple of balls, you lay off a score, and then it's just complete shutdown. We talk about deny. We talk about the deny side of the game. I remember 68 minutes into the game, um, so starved of possession, going back inside my 13-meter line to look for the ball. I got, I was playing corner forward the same day. I received possession off the goalkeeper 100 metres from where I should have been on the pitch. Turned and boom. Two hands on, turned me back towards the end line, had to go back towards my goalkeeper and 
it was just an absolute eye opener for me at 21 years of age, 22 years of age on the approach, the intensity and making a statement with a use of a construct of the game, which was just deny. It wasn't delay, it wasn't dispossess, it was just completely deny possession. So it changes slightly and we shift the focus towards being understanding the game as a unit, defending as a unit of 15, understanding your role within that group, hunting impacts, areas of urgency, pair, areas of the pitch that we want to starve, pe starve teams of possession in, and areas of the pitch that we, we know that they want to enter in order to create easy scoring opportunities and we don't want to leave free. It shifts the focus towards set plays, open discussions, player-led discussions, and more towards team structure. And again, the pathway that we've developed allows us to move into that area. It allows us to say that at the child level, we've built a movement base. At the youth level, we've expanded on the movement base and made it specific. We've built a skill base and understanding around basic constructs and concepts of the game to allow at adult level them to experience the approach of different managers, different coaches, apply what they know to what their coach knows, learn and grow. And again, the pathway continues to be the pathway of learning, processing, failing, succeeding and continuing to grow. So we can move on to the next slide. I'm just going to pass it back over to Gary and he's going to cover the delay in the night and then I'll be back to talk to you soon. That's perfect, Peter. Thanks. Yeah, that, that actually brings us nicely into this now, I suppose. This is kind of the meat of the, of the, I suppose, webinar, as we call it, that, you know, we're actually learning, I suppose, the different components that we have in our tackle in our game today and the key teaching points that we will look at of each actual skill and just kind of categorise them. But I'll just talk about it a bit more in detail now. So in front of us, we have our four Ds of defending and these are our main components of the tackle that, you know, I suppose we kind of use in a stage process so that our players are utilising each stage correctly to develop on the next stage of the component. So if we've ever watched... Um, if you've ever watched the dodgeball movie, so the dodgeball movie and Patches O'Houlihan, he was the coach and he was on the wheelchair and he had his leather jacket and he always talked about that there was five Ds of dodgeball and he said you dodge, duck, dip, dive and dodge. But we've kind of had the same thing here and we have our four Ds of defending and we call it our delay or deny or dispossess and develop. So the de defensive play is compromised of both individual and team tackling or defending. So the purpose of this session tonight is to focus, I suppose, primarily on the technical aspects of the individual tackle. So learn the key teach points of each tackling skill rather than, I suppose, the defensive systems or the more tactical bases of our, of our defensive stuff. Because I think we could do another webinar on that thing alone, you know. So the principles of our delay, deny, dispossession are all part of the tackle and we have grouped each skill under each of the four D principles and <clears throat> and um, we're going to look at them and then finally we're going to look at how you develop on from this and the distribution and we know you have tackled you've won the ball and you're working out from defense and to link in I suppose that support play and that platform for our attack so I'm going to move on to the next slide so we have our first one, which we're going to look at, which is delay. So our delay, when we are talking about our four Ds, you're going to see a certain, certain key aspects of each of the four of them in your core tackling skills. So the reason we have grouped and linked the main core skills, like your blocking and your near hand tackle to a certain principle of your defensive D, is purely just for explanation purposes and making it easier to pick out to pick out the skills and make it easier to understand. So that's why we kind of put them into the subcategories like this. So the first one is delay, and we see it in front of it there. So immediately when we hear the word delay, we straight away resemble it to the slowing down of something or preparing to stop something. And it is simply that. It is one of the most important and effective stages in any form of tackle and we are trying to use in any stage of the game. 
So the buzzword here is the slowing down or the stopping of momentum. So as a defender, if we can prioritize getting ourselves into a position that in turn is going to make it more difficult with the person in position, you're winning already. So Noel is going to show us the actual key teaching points of some of the um, some of the tackling skills involved that you see there on the screen. And he's also going to show um, he's also going to show uh, a game based thing that we can actually do on the field. But um, for a second, we we'll just keep looking at this. So we're going to have a look at um, how we delay. And the main ones I picked out here, and you can see them there, they're numbered. It's your shadowing, your marking, the check in a player's run, and finally making that contact. So making the initial contact to stop a player's momentum going forward can be a great tool in the process of actually winning the ball back from the player in position. So I'm going to focus on now the key teach points in applying the delay and how the skills are used in a drill or a game based um or in a game pace feature that we that we're actually going to see now in a minute in the video. But Peter has touched on a lot of this already. So the timing of the contact is essential. It's what all the smart tacklers do in it's the time to stop the player properly. And once the positive contact is made, you have to, you've put the player in position under pressure and now they have to make a, a, a decision. So this is now um, when we can say that we have developed the player and that the focus is now that we can turn that we can turn our focus now on the ball. So the next two videos are going to show us. Um, I hope they come through there, Noel. You might be able to um, put them up there. So the first one's going to show us how we can actually initially stop the player with our frontal tackle. And the second one then is going to show us just a little game-based thing that we can actually put it into practice. So Noel, you might see, can you um, put them up there? us and protect our goals or where the attacker would like to attack. We would also use it as we transition from our near hand tackle into our frontal tackle and how we shape See that our there, legs. Is that coming up on the screen, Peter? This, an opposition player. For our frontal tackle, we're looking to assume an athletic position, so feet shoulder width apart, knees over toes, shoulders over knees, okay. and my okay. hands sink to my body. If my hands move out from my body, it puts me in a situation where, yes, it makes my body bigger, but it also leads potentially to me reacting with my hands. We're always coaching our players to react with their feet and stay where they are strong. I am weak out here. A player can either blow past me or if they go down either side, I will grip, I will rip or I will foul. What I'm looking to do all the time, stay central as best I possibly can, react with my feet and tackle with my hands. We're always looking to tackle with the ball. Now, there are a couple of other things we can add to this. If the goal is over my right shoulder, I can open a gap to my left, making the area that they want to attack going towards goals that little bit smaller. So I'm forcing them away from goals all the time. We're always looking to push players away from goals as best we possibly can to make their angle for shooting that little bit more difficult. Remember, Feet shoulder width apart, knees over toes, shoulders over knees. I'm primed and ready to move here. I'm looking to keep my feet apart, move side to side, drop off. And when the opposition player picks a place to go, I'm looking to push off with the foot that's going to send me in that direction and move with them. Thinking delay and deny. And when I get my chance, dispossess. Tackle the ball with the hands. Our main coaching point being react with your feet. Tackle with your hands, always tackling. Yeah, yeah, that's great, Noel. So, that's our key teach point. So, we might just show the one now and just putting that, yeah. that initial stopping into a game play video. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's trying to get the ball back, please, without the two. I think I'm going to next to the ball in the 
and just he's gonna run it to you twice. What is it? It's a slap. This is it. Not seeing not seeing much pace at the start. Just a little bit to start by two yards further back and come towards him. So I might shout every time. Ready, go! Yeah, alright, 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 go back, go back, go back, back, yeah. Ready, go! Okay, on the balls, on the balls, after, on the ball carrier, be careful, yeah? So you have to play the ball. Be careful. 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 You So that was just a short snippet of a simple drill that's done in partners. And it's firstly, you're getting that positive contact and stopping the player. You're getting your feet position right and you're getting your hands correct on the player so that you can now go on to actually ta tackle and target the ball. So that's our delay, which brings us on now to our deny. So I'm just going to move it on there again. That does a bit slow. So we're on to our deny now. So when we look at deny, the main points that we are looking at to impose is, is the closing down of space and not giving the player on the ball any easy decision, or even better, any chance to move the ball on to another area of the pitch. So what skill would we relate to, the, to this denying of opportunity to be? So the one that I put into this um, bracket is our block down skill. It's a very important and a traditional skill of the game but it's a skill that can be forgotten about and a skill that I suppose as coaches we probably neglect in our training. Also on this point it, it can be an area of especially especially at underage our players are not comfortable with performing the skill and maybe it's from a lack of confidence and a lack of bravery to actually get in nice and close to the person and that they are marking and also it's just the willingness to stop the ball so how can we actually, how can we as coaches, can we develop these, this, this skill in a positive way? So the first one is actually going to show us, we're going to go into the videos again. So the first one's going to be um, the key teaching points again of Peter talking about the block down. And then we're going to go into um, a video that's going to show the block down in practice at a training. And it's just, it's going to show how we can bring the block down in a way that it's going to make it comfortable for a player to do it and make it easier for them to try it and I suppose get more brave with the actual skill. So Noel, you might play the first one, which would be Peter going through the key teaching points. So just block give a down. listen here. There are a number of key components. Number one being my hand positioning and what I'm doing with my arms. Number two being keeping my head up and my eye on the ball to build bravery in the individual not just for protection, but also to give us the best chance to perform the skill. And number three being timing, getting to the ball at the point of contact, which would be the kick in this instance, making sure that we're not getting there too early or too late and we're performing a full block down. We can look at our block down as not just a means of preventing a scoring opportunity, but also a means of regaining possession. For our block down, our key teaching points are making sure I keep my hands together at all times, creating as minimal a gap between my hands as I possibly can. Finger side by side, hands side by side. When I'm looking to perform my block down, I'm looking for my player to step in and get close to the kicker's leg. From here, I'm making sure that my hands are coming from the centre of my chest and out in front of my face that direct line in front of my face at all times. If my hands are coming from here to behind my head to exaggerate the full block down, it's much more difficult to get my timing right. I'm building bravery in the player, hands coming from here, allowing me to keep my head up and my eyes on the ball and to block down in a solid position. Building bravery in an individual co could come from, as a coach, I take charge and I'm performing the kick because I'm in control of the swing. My player steps in and blocks down. Then progressing to in pairs, one player blocks down from their knees, the other steps in and kicks. And the idea for the player is just hence to come from here together and block the kicker's leg. Block the kicker's leg all the time. Then we progress the same thing to moving and then challenge them in a game scenario. The key is 
keep your head up and your eye on the ball. If we arrive too early, we'll be kicked through. If we arrive too late, we won't get our block in and we'll be sold and the player can go around us twice as easy. Nice and brave, hands together, and our block comes from the centre of our chest, not from behind our head. That's super. And Noel, just the next video, so, and we'll be nearly there to pass it on then to Peter. So the next video is just going to show how that we can, I suppose, get the courage, get the courage that's going to beat the fear of backing down the ball in an actual training session routine. Um, I like the big fella, but I'm just a, a bit disappointed he was only there for the ball. Lift the option is called the same. So here, basically, we're going to focus on the block. We're giving you the um, back of the bag of the little pushes so you can really go after the block. So basically, you're going to go three in a row. You're going to go block, 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 <coughs> block, 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 block. Really, really, really important thing. Probably the most important thing. After making the block, you have to go three in the ball. All well and good making a block is the opposition keeps the ball and try to go. So three blocks in a row, last one and three in the ball. We'll do, it, uh, we'll do two separate things. It's just a demo. Last one, after you, 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 That'll do. That's perfect. So, guys, that was just a simple little drill that I just think it's a novel, it's a novel way for players to to to, to just get, I suppose, or key teach points across and actually getting them to do the actual block down. Because some of them mightn't be comfortable with, with that actual skill. So I just think it was a nice way that you know it might encourage them to actually perform the skill. A small bit better. So we've gone through our delay and deny. I'm going to hand you over to Peter now, and he's going to look at our disposition of the ball with the use of our near hand tackle and then our develop. So, Peter, you can walk away there now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks for that, Gary. So, moving on to, to disposition, I understand as well that. It, some of the videos may be coming across a little bit bitty. Some of the messaging may not align with the picture at times. I saw there that um, we were talking about hands overhead for the block down is the last thing we'd want to see. And the language didn't exactly align with the video. Just to give a bit of clarity to that, the last thing we want is, yes, we want that reach, but we want that reach within control. So if we can keep chin above arm level at all times, it gives us that buffer for our hands to be blocked to be make the blocking action, but allows us as well to keep that that safety element where our hands aren't behind our head and our head is completely exposed. Again, creating that bravery in either the child or the youth and then transferring that technique to adult level then. Um, so I think we can play the video around the near hand tackle. And again, if it's if the picture is a little bit bitty and it's not aligning, the language itself may be something that we can refer to. So I think it may be as some bit beneficial in that sense. And uh, I'm sorry as well if to anyone who thought they were getting away from me talking and then all of a sudden a video of me talking popped up. Um, but uh, that was Gary's decision. So we, we, we'll hang that one on Gary there. Um, so we might play the video just based around that near hand tackle around that disposition, that next aspect of, of defending, please, Noel, if that's okay. Defending is all about attitude and application. It's about working hard and understanding the importance of contesting and competing. But it is as much of an art as any of the creative side of the game. It's about timing, it's about reading the play, and it's about correct decision making, applying what I know to the situation I'm in to get the best outcome I can for my team. 
as regards the near hand tackle, we are always looking because we were probably using the near hand tackle in a situation where I would be chasing a player. I'm always looking to hunt my player down on the inside of where they're looking to go, pushing my player away from goal. I am looking to get hip to hip with my player as if I'm a yard behind. It will force me to reach my near hand and I will pull on the shoulder or the outer arm of the player causing a foul. We're looking to limit fouls. Get hip to hip with the player and do my work early to get myself in a position where I can tackle. My tackle comes from my near hand at all times and I am looking to come across as opposed to down. Down is a grabbing and pulling motion. I can pull a player back and that's a foul. We're looking to get across and we're thinking tackling the ball near hand all the time, taking my outside hand out. If my outside hand comes across, it puts me off balance. It gives the player that I'm tackling something to grab onto and they could fall from this. And it also baits me into using my near hand to place it on the player's back, it could tip them over and that's another foul. Near hand tackle discipline all the time, hand across, hip to hip. Ideally, if the outside player's outside foot is on the front step, I'm looking to get my hip across to get myself into a position where I can delay or deny and frontal tackle. Near hand all the time, getting hip to hip, stopping, delaying and denying the player that I'm tackling, going where they want to go and doing what they want to do. From this position, then I'm looking to dispossess. The likelihood of me delaying and denying is higher than the likelihood of me dispossessing. So taking my time, picking on the solo of the player that I'm trying to tackle, to pick my chance to dispossess at all times. Encouraging my player to think with the three Ds and also to think tackle the ball and not the player. You're on mute there, Peter. Sorry, yeah, no, thank you. We'll just head back to uh, the presentation there Gary um I know you're in charge of that side of things so we'd, so we're looking at dispossessions and there was a couple of key points that I'd just like to draw out there dispossessions are the holy grail dispossessions are what we're looking for every situation or scenario that we create from a defensive point of view in, is in order to create opportunities for that tackle for that disposition um turnovers now are the key stat in games they they are a uh, they're a direct reflection on your efficiency with the ball and your efficiency off the ball or your setup and structure in that sense. So um, can everybody see the presentation there or? I don't think the presentation's up, but that's OK. We'll just hammer on. Dispossessions, again, are a huge boost for your team. And it's a, it's again, it's a scenario we're looking to set up as much as we possibly can. But it's also an extra attack for you and one less attack for your opponent. Um, when we talk about dispossessions, it's it's those clean dispossessions. It's those dispossessions that put the ball in favour of us winning it. So Is there, there now, Peter. Sorry, they have cut across yeah. If you can just start the slideshow from there, Gary, I'd say it'll hammer on perfectly. It's 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 up there. Yeah, I can see your screen, but it I think it's start start slideshow would be the job. Sorry, we might we might just leave the laptop alone for a while. It kind of goes slow. Like myself, um. That okay? That's absolutely bang on. So yeah. again, we have to look at the risk for reward. Again, like I said, the probability of delaying and denying is a lot high in order to get support within set up for that tackle. But areas at a pitch where there might be times where I might have to offer up a score instead of a goal scoring opportunity of someone coming in behind me or it being a two on one, three on one defensive situation is the last thing we want being the last defender back against two forwards or three forwards running towards us. So it's that risk reward. What's the best time to go for that dispossession? What's the most efficient way technically to approach it from a tackling point of view myself? And just below that point, what are the signs for dispossession? So if we've done our job very, very well, we will have delayed or denied. So if we can get a player dawdling on the ball or in a standing position where we can force ourselves or we can initiate the initial impact or contact, that's an ideal time to maybe potentially go for a dispossession. Now, we need to be conscious as well that the forward player could be baiting us into this situation so that they can slip us easily. But if we align our body with exactly like we were talking about earlier, feet shoulder with a part, opening the space that we would prefer them to move into and forcing them the long way around us as opposed to the short route to goal 
we will get opportunities to redefine that situation or we will get an opportunity for a teammate to come in and support us in that setup. Soloing on the inside leg for me would be an opportunity and a sign for dispossession. That's my opportunity to go for dispossession. So if I can chase down near hand tackle, get my elbow past their bicep or forearm to put myself in a position where I potentially align my hip or my hip is within six or six inches or a foot of their hip, I'm in position to compete then. And then if they solo on the inside leg or the leg closest to me, I would view that as an opportunity. I can get my hand in and across or I can hook that ball across away from them. Soloing above hip height, a sloppy solo, something that travels up is an opportunity for me to dispossess them for the fact that their center of mass changes. If they can stay low when they're soloing, they're in much more control of their own body weight because their center of gravity or the center of mass is lower. But as soon as they have to reach at shoulder height or above shoulder height to pull a ball back into possession, they become that slightly, that slight bit more unbalanced. And that's where I can really, really use my approach to cut across their line, become hip to hip in order to put them off balance and approach again, attacking the ball. So dispossessions, like I said, are key. They're the turnovers, the stat that currently defines our game. Um, and if we just move on to develop then, Winning the ball, transitioning from defence to attack, from suffocation to score. So I, I liken this, and I liken I liken this cluster tackle to a breath, an in breath and an out breath. So what we're looking to do, when you breathe out, again, sometimes it can be a relaxation, but if you breathe out past a certain point, we tense up, and it's that need for oxygen again. That's what we're looking to create. We're looking to create that situation where we can go two on one, three on one, four on one, so that we can suffocate that situation and increase our opportunities for a turnover. But in order to develop the play, then it's almost like you go past that point of exhalation and you must gasp for air. And in order for us to develop the play, then and maximize our opportunity to punish a turnover, we're looking for that breath. So as as efficiently as we close in on an opponent, we must expand and open out as best we possibly can. If I was to pick three keywords for me that would approach that, develop and again, because if we dispossess, oftentimes it's an opportunity for us to really, really go at an open opponent in a certain area of the game or a certain time or aspect of the game that we, we may not be afforded that luxury very, very often in the game. So I would think with pace and punish, close in, force the dispossession. As soon as the dispossession is forced, open out, create with punch holes and apply pace and look to punish. Also, just another point for defensive side of things and developing. We're looking at the tackle, but yes, we just want to make one key point on the role of the point of attack in defensive shape. At a certain point in time, in order for you to maximize the impact of your tackle and put something on the scoreboard, really turning someone over, you will need an opportunity or a focal point or a point of attack to get up the pitch at the earliest opportunity you can. That means at some stage, a designated forward or a number of designated forwards disengaging from the defensive side of the game and giving us a point of attack and that can be anywhere on the pitch for me if i'm on the end line of my own goals with possession a point of attack for me is anyone that's really above me that's going to allow me a stable base to go and pivot off or move forward up the pitch so a key a key then would be somebody on the 45 somebody on the 21 where you can be most dangerous and allow your team to create and now we can go into this in incredible detail or we can beat it to death but it's just a little point i want to make we tackle and we dispossess and we defend in order to afford ourselves the luxury to go and play and this is the developing side of the game that drive that open and in order to facilitate us maximizing the impact of the tackle we need people to offer us a focal point or a point of attack and then just the target and it's in something that's mentioned, it's between six and nine seconds for some teams. It's between eight, it's eight seconds, six seconds, seven seconds for others. But it's reactivity of team to the turnover. If we turn over and we sense that an opposition team are wide open, ideally we have seven seconds to either make a ball go dead or create 
a scoring opportunity, all based off what we've just spoke about in the develop side of things. So moving on to looking elsewhere for inspiration, I'm very conscious of time. Um, I wanted to go a, a little bit of a different route in looking elsewhere for inspiration. We look at general body shape of the people in defensive scenarios in these two pictures. And I always pick out little snippets and little little ideas of or, or little examples of good body position in games. When I'm watching games from a soccer point of view, Aaron Mombasaka playing fullback for Manchester United at the moment, I just think he's incredible in how he shapes his body and the fact that he just comes up time and time again against the top wingers in the Premier League and he, he really, really competes and you, you re very rarely see him taken to the cleaners. Now, sometimes you see him at the pin of his collar, 100%, um, making last-ditch tackles that are incredibly well-timed, which is another aspect of the game. But for if we look at soccer, similar defensive body shape. A lot of fullbacks in that mould will use end line and sideline as an extra defender, force their player away from the middle. They want them to go the long way around them. They have that body shape where they slightly retract. Let's say Virgil van Dijk is standing there. He wants Messi to go the way he is going. So he slightly retracts the leg closest to us, shapes his body that way and creates a little funnel for Lionel Messi to go down. Um, some players, they'll want to cut back in on their legs. Other players, you'll want them to go the long way around you, force them to the end line to give your centre-back a better chance to, de to, to defend their situation. But if we look at the body shape, we see it occurring continually throughout the game. In, in our games, in soccer, in basketball, in, in American football, how they get that low centre of gravity, feet shoulder apart, on the balls of your feet, primed for movement, using the sideline for support and eyes on the opposition players' hips because that's going to dictate where they go. Um, in basketball, then, again, it's a similar body shape. You can see there from the defender in front of us, he has his left leg slightly retracted, but he has his strong body position shifted to his right. So even if the player that he's up against goes the long way around him and try or steps the long way around him and tries to cut inside him, he has a lot of his weight shifted to his right leg. So again, he can keep... Mass will always move mass, but mass also stops mass. The more body we can put between the player we're looking to defend and where they want to go, ultimately the better result for us. Also, just one little point I want to make. That lead hand can be another key element. If we look at this basketball player here, that lead hand in order to judge distance and understand it also in order to judge distance and understand kind of the awareness of the space between me and the person that I am looking to defend, but it also creates a little buffer between me and them that will allow me to react to their movement, which I always need as a defender. I'm looking to create opportunities where I can dictate the the state of play, where they want to go, but ultimately they're in possession and they make the decision and I have to be reactive to that to a certain extent. Again, his placement is allowing his hand placement is allowing him to judge distance, okay, just not seeing those slides, what we might do again is is, uh, is reset it up, or if again, if you'd like to to try and log out and log back in again, that might have some impact. Um, but again, not only does it, it allow us to judge distance, but it, it impedes the natural ball position of where exactly the player you're playing against wants to hold the ball. Um, so we'll just move on. And what I'd like to do is just for a minute or two, I'd like to give you an opportunity to just, we've been very word heavy there um, for the last couple of minutes. And what I'd just like to do is I'd just like to give you a minute to, to look at the images that are currently up on the screen and be critical of it. Do you know, um, looking at that there now, I spoke about Johnny McCarthy down again earlier on and you look at him in the bottom right hand corner and there he is making it look like an accident again. Um, we look at Kevin Cassidy here in the middle getting absolutely manhandled in the swarm tackle. I don't know how he came out of that physically. I hope he's all right. But what I'd just like to do is I'd just like to give you a minute, uh, a break from me talking again before we move on to the next slide. Um, and again, be critical of what you see in the scenarios or pick out something that, that you like about certain aspects of, of the pictures here. So I hope I hope that's enough time. Um, there are a couple of different areas there that that 
or a couple, hopefully a couple of different things we can take from that. And, and just moving on to a games-based approach and our different approach. Um, so we're looking at children, the, the emphasis on fun games and this being a constant in their development. How can we put them in situations or how can we allow them to learn through situations that we place them in um, that's going to help them learn to a certain extent unbeknownst to themselves, creating that positive language that they can identify with all the way through. Um, and that's just, again, just about reframing. So we talk about language, movement and awareness. We're looking to create body awareness and exactly an understanding of how their hands and feet work in tandem with each other and how they move, a language they can identify with and put them in situations where movement is either constantly stimulated is what we're looking to do. So to give an example of this, uh, just an idea that I want to talk about athletic position with anybody between the ages of of six and nine. I want them to fall into a natural position where they're on the balls of their feet, feet are shoulder width apart, knees are over toes and shoulders are over knees, but they don't really care about the athletic position and that's fully understandable. So what I would do then is just as an example, I play a game of rats and rabbits where we have a line of cones up along the middle. We have pairs all the way down along this line of cone and they're in direct competition or they're playing the game in tandem with each other. If I put up my right hand, the person on this side of the cone tries to get past a line that's designated on the far side without the person here tagging them. And I let them play that. I let them play that game. And then I'll ask them, is there anybody here that's not getting away? Or is there anybody here that got away two times but didn't get away three times? And again, I get responses because we'll be looking to engage. And from there, then I'll say, I won't talk to them about their tackle. I won't talk to them about body position. I won't talk to them about their athletic stance. What I'll say is these are the small things that are going to help you to get away from the person you're working with currently. So I want you to copy me, feet shoulder width apart, lift your heels a small bit off the ground so you can feel the spongy part of your foot, bend your knees, sit slightly back into your chair and have your hands here ready to move. And then you're waiting for me to react, whatever hand goes up and whatever foot is in the opposite to the direction you want to go. If you want to go in this direction, you push this foot into the ground. If you want to go in this direction, you push this foot into the ground. That's coaching them into the athletic position for what their game requires. The game that they're playing at the moment, the fun game, and we're building agility, we're building an understanding around language. They will understand that this is the position I want you to be in. And I'll say, we'll just call that the athletic position. Feet shoulder width apart, shoulder, knees over toes, shoulders over knees hands neutral. So moving on then, the focus shifts at youth level. And there was a couple of questions raised around this last week that, uh, that I thought would really, really add to what we're doing in this presentation. So I, I just want to, I just want to kind of broach that subject. This is about questioning, coaching and reflection. So we talk about the youth. We want shapes, we want to coach, we want technique, and we want situations and scenarios. We want them to take ownership for their learning process, and we want to create an environment that stimulates reflection on their part. So what we want to do is, the question that was asked in particular the last week was, how often would you approach this in a session? How much time would you give to it in each session? And, and what, what would be your timing along those, along those lines? And to be honest with you, my answer kind of went down a completely different route. If we're looking at the long term development of a youth athlete, we need to be thinking slightly, slightly broader and a slightly longer kind of term view of development. Yes, we want to be competitive and it's our learning to compete age, but in order to learn to compete, we need to focus in on these key aspects of the game, knowing how to defend, understanding, it, defending technique around it. And again, the same on the opposite, the attacking side of the game. So. If I was to be asked that question, my answer would be pick your team. For one month, every session has a learning outcome related to tackling. This week, we're going to cover the chase tackle. Next week, we're going to cover the frontal tackle. Then we're going to cover blocking the week after. Then we're going to go into 2v2s, 2v1s, 3v1s, 3v2s and create discussion. Stimulate reflection on your individual player. Allow them to go away, ask them questions come back and have some form of an answer. And you also want to put them in situations where they have to come up with the answer themselves. I will always refer to this point. Let the game, 
B, do what you wanted to do. Make sure the game is your mass is your servant and not your master. Um, and from there, then another question that was posed: if we're talking about our approach to working with youth athletes, is the kind of disparity between the, the size of a player. You could have someone who two players who are 14, one is built like an 18 year old, one is built like an 11 or 12 year old, depending on a growth spurt. And if we talk about our approach to coaching, I will always go back to technique trumps absolutely everything. A quote that again resonates with me um, will be along the lines of precision beats tower power and timing beats speed. So I would to a certain extent, encourage that smaller player to go with the bigger player, but I would control the task as a coach. I would lay a different kind of outlay and I would say, instead of restricting space, that would allow for the power and the strength of the player to become a bigger aspect, I would open the space. I would give them unlimited space and what I would look, what I would shift the focus towards is the smaller player, you are focusing on dispositions. I don't want you to make contact. I don't want you to look for a hit. I don't want you to hang out with the player. I want you to bide your time, pick your time, make sure you're in the athletic position, keep your feet shoulder width apart. And when you get the opportunity, when the ball is offered up, look for a clean disposition. Just shift the focus of what you're looking to coach in order to level the playing field. And like I said, technique is always, always, always the greatest leveler of any game. So moving on to adult, the one point I want to make about adult level is we change our focus to a certain extent towards discussions and set plays and we have coaches come in and they have a certain way that they want to play the game and you must adapt to that based on what you've learned at youth level and based on what you're constantly learning throughout the game. I made the point earlier that I really, really started my learning process when I, to a certain extent, became an adult. Some people might say that I haven't become an adult yet, but um, the big thing here is fundamental movement skills in children's movement are key, but fundamental movement skills are constantly present in the stages of development all the way through to adult level. They just manifest themselves in different ways. So your basic movement patterns that you see constantly in games become your fundamental movements. So your that that straddle stance that we were talking about, we can incorporate those things into our warm ups, into our different activities in order to again stimulate that kind of that constant, constant repetition and building that good habit fundamental movements never leave the formula and it's always present and it just presents itself differently. Um, so if we just move on quickly to, I'll just run through the next slide, I'm conscious of, very conscious of time. Games-based approach is a constraints-led approach and it's important not to con over constrain as much as we possibly can. Making the constraints relevant, one or two constraints at most are a condition on the game in order to make that game do what we want to do. And if they solve it, it's not about spoiling it. So if they solve it, it's about acknowledging the fact that you, acknowledging the fact that it was solved, incredibly well done, and then exploring other avenues which, which are questioning. I made a point here, conscious coach, conscious player. So the more conscious you are of the pathway, your awareness around the player's development, the more conscious your player will become. The more we probe with questions and create an opportunity and create an environment that, that kind of breeds off reflection and um, that's exactly what is going to make the player that we're looking to looking to um, produce. Design and ma manipulation of games, understanding of exactly what the game is going to do and again if it doesn't exactly do what you designed it to do on the night, reflecting yourself, being a conscious coach, going away and thinking right that didn't work perfectly there but it can work in a different way. Your use of questioning, open-ended questions that's going to stimulate discussion but finding the balance between the discussion not drawing on too long. If we can keep it to a couple of different points and then allow them to try that one or two points in the next game. Providing opportunities for dialogue, asking players questions and again that's just built over time with patience. You control the task. It's an open supportive environment and you control the task. They control the outcome and it's about discussing that between and coming to that happy medium where we have learned something and we have developed. Is the game reflective of what they face? Of is the activity reflective of what they will face in the game? We must constantly ask ourselves these questions around our game's best approach. Matching perception to the correct action. It's about how your players perceive what they're doing, and then 
having a bank of resources themselves that they can draw on in order to perform the correct action. We're always trying to stimulate reflection. And as a rule of thumb for us as coaches, no principles, no purpose. So if it doesn't underpin a principle that we would hold in high regard or high esteem the game, it has no purpose in our training session. And you'll be quite happy to know that this is the last slide for me and you'll be back with Gary coaching the tackle. I just want to run through a couple of quick coaching points that may not have gone, gone through on the video. Feet shoulder width apart, knees over feet, shoulders over knees. Balls of your feet in a quarter squat position, elbows tucked and hands up. The last thing we want to be caught is we are weak out here. We are always strong closer to our center of mass. Mass move mass and mass stops mass. Where it's relative to position on the pitch, ball carrier, amount and area of space and numbers. So it's a constantly changing structure and it's difficult to make the right decision constantly in these defensive scenarios because the landscape is always changing. In our chase tackle, we're looking for our inside hand and turn away from goal or into bodies. So we're looking to turn into support or make them go the long way around. We want every chase tackle ultimately to develop in a frontal tackle. So we want to, our chase tackle to develop into a position where I put myself between them and the goals. Align hip with hip, cut their line and your anchor arm. We spoke about anchor arm earlier on. We need to be very, very careful that when we go with our near hand, it becomes our anchor arm. When our elbow passes our opponent's bicep or their center line of their body, then I'm in a position to reach for a dispossession. But I need to be conscious of the fact that they could cut back inside or this arm then, regardless of where I am, becomes my anchor arm. If I'm slightly behind them, it will anchor to their back. If I cut across their line, it can anchor and lift their center of gravity a small bit in order for me to cut across them and make my tackle a little bit more effective. React with your feet and make deliberate action with your hands. In, out, constant, active hands. Awareness of space, options, and threat in behind at all times. Mass moves mass, I said, and mass stops mass. Control your center of mass. Is there anything to be said for another mass? Um, again, it's bodies between bodies. And if I was to liken it to anything, I would liken it to bumper cars. If we are in a bumper car, we are looking always constantly for the contact. We look for the contact, we look for the contact. Once we make contact, our bumpers are designed to absorb impact. So we take the impact and there's a little kind of rebounce where a little bit of space comes between me and the person we're working on. That's where the lead arm in basketball comes in in order to judge that space, but we've stopped momentum. Bumper cars stop momentum. I close the space again, which is the natural reaction again. And then I look for next job, whether that's dispossession, whether that's a, a loose ball that I'm looking to pick up, whether that's shepherding him into an area because I'm in a kind of, I'm in a disadvantaged defensive position myself. So if I was to emphasize any points here, it would be along the lines of body position in the first three points we've made. We want every chase tackle to develop into frontal tackle and we're balancing or we're battling constantly for that dominant position. Make sure your anchor hand is an anchor hand that's working for you and not for a referee or an opposition player. And from there then, it's just awareness. Awareness of where you are in the pitch, where they are on the pitch, where the bodies are, and what is the greatest threat. Mass moves mass, bumper cars absorb impact. So I'm just going to pass you over to Gary. I think that's the last bit from, from me. Um, yeah, no, that's so good, Peter. Session planning, yeah. Peter, I, I think we've loads done there. You've gone through a lot. Um, it was excellent. Um, we're just conscious of the time, lads. We are there. So... What, what, what we'd like to do now is just, I suppose, thank you for coming. I suppose, first of all, tonight and giving your time to it. You know, we're on nearly an hour and a half now. So this can be very wordy stuff on a platform like this. It, you know, it's so much easier, I suppose, if we were out in the field and we were showing you these things with a group of with a group of players. So I suppose what we want to do now is is leave the floor open, I suppose. Um, unmute if you have any questions. Put it into the chat box. Me and Peter are going to stay on here for a while if if there's a few questions to be asked. But I think I I I, I think we've um, definitely enough information given. And um, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much, lads, for um for listening in.
and if anyone wants to um if anyone likes to contact us directly um we might put in our um email addresses there into the conversation box i can get onto us directly okay Fine. And just for me, I'd like to thank everybody for logging on. I hope there was something that you took out of it. Uh, I'm sorry it, it dragged on a little bit there, um, but uh, it was beneficial for you. And again, like I said, it's 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 a real honour to have you all logging on and uh, and listening to us speak. So exactly to reiterate Gary's point, we can offer up any help that you require. Just we we'll drop our emails and, and and contact details into the into the chat box here. And I just we just have a question from from George here. As a defender attacking a player coming at me at full speed, how can I stop him legally? If I have arms in, he goes around me, arms out, he will draw the foul. How can I avoid the foul but yet stop him? Um, so, yeah, that's an absolutely excellent question. And it's, again, what I would say is that that lead hand, that judging of space, sometimes if a player is running hard at you, he's cut a line and he has received the ball off the shoulder, and you have adapted from one defensive situation to another defensive situation, you may not have time to react. And that's something that's outside of your control. The only thing that I can say here is that it's that honesty of effort, that selflessness of effort that comes from Key and Lynch's kind of description earlier on. It's that opportunity that somebody will slow him up. Somebody will allow me an opportunity to recover. And then it's about getting in around that second tackle. Now, if there's an opportunity there where he's coming at speed and I have an opportunity to set my feet and back up, it's about not letting him go past me. Sometimes it's about conceding a little bit of space by retreating in a positive body position like we spoke about with the basketball earlier on or the soccer earlier on in order to not allow him to go around me. So if I need to drop two or three yards in order to not fall for the step that is defending in that scenario the only thing is what that does is that offers that player a little bit more time on the ball in order to either pick a pass or pass and go so it's about finding the balance it's about the greatest threat and understanding the situation I mean and the only two way you can do that with players is is that little bit of coaching that reflection and putting them in those scenarios as much as you possibly can in game so like I said second tackle can I get if I have been passed can I recover with that honesty of effort and if I haven't been passed if I need to completely retreat because it's 2v1 or he's gone around me a couple of times or he's in a stronger position in order to force him to take a solo stop up scan for a second so that I can close space again. I hope that answered it. If it doesn't, you can you can drop another question into the chat box. Yeah, just one here from Tig. If a player has the ball in two hands as if he's ready to solo, is the tackler allowed to slap the ball away or does it have to be in one hand only? So Tig, what I'm trying to gather this properly now. If the player who has the ball that's ready to solo I suppose you'd be hoping that when they're soloing the ball that they'd probably only have the ball in one hand because they'd be dropping from their strong hand to their strong foot when they're actually soloing the ball. So we try to say that you solo with right right hand drops to right foot, left hand drops to left foot. So you'd be hoping that they're dropping with one hand because they're using the other hand to, I suppose, keep their balance or keep an opposing player away from them. But when we, I suppose, talk about the tackler, and to slap the ball away, we would we would um, look at the one hand only, getting in that near hand tackle, depending on where our position is to the person who has the ball. So I hope that answers that question. Um, and, and just to add to that, being being allowed to slap the ball away, I to be honest with you, I don't think it's offered up until it releases, it's released from mm -hmm. hand. So, so okay. if we're if we have a ball in two hands, it's it's not in a position where we yeah. can tackle it. Really, to be quite honest with you, the solo. you can get hands on the ball to a certain extent. So we talk about the lead hand here, that lead hand in order that that we're using to judge distance can impede the ball to a certain extent. But it's the slapping action that's defined in the rule that that is the issue. Um, if a player is holding the ball in two hands and soloing from 
two hands to one foot back up into two hands, they're going to be a little bit off balance because they don't have this hand out for balance. So we're going to be in an, a little bit of an advantageous position that way defending. But I hope that answers your question um, from, from myself and Gary. If it, if it doesn't again, you can pop another question to the chat box. Yeah, and then the, the full presentation will be will be given to anyone who registered for the um, for the webinars. So that will be out to you in the next few days. You'll be able to watch it back.